right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we'll make a start. Um, my name is Karen Baker. Uh, I am the, a fellow in Pacific politics uh, with the Department of Pacific Affairs, and I'll be your chair for this session. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, uh, and um, I acknowledge their elders past and present. Um, we also have um, people joining us on Zoom uh, from various parts of um, this country and across the world, um, and I extend that respect to the tra traditional landowners um, of that land as well. Um, so this uh, panel uh, is on the PNG elections and challenges for democracy. Um, as most of you will know, the 2022 PNG elections took place uh, in July this year. Uh, while PNG has an unbroken record of regularly scheduled elections since independence, the logistical and political challenges uh, of running an election in PNG are immense. Uh, and this panel brings together five experts um, to discuss the unique political dynamics um, and challenges of elections in PNG. Um, first off, we have um, Ariane Kassman, uh, who is the CEO of Transparency International Papua New Guinea, um, who's uh, travelled here from Port Moresby, and we're really, um, really thrilled to, to have her here. Um, and the other four speakers are my colleagues in the Department of Pacific Affairs. Um, we have Associate Professor Anthony Regan, um, Dr. Colin Wiltshire, Dr. Tiago Central Alperman, and Professor Nicole Haley. Um, so to read more about their bios, um, please uh, look into your programs. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we do have five um, speakers to get through. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Ariane. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Dr. Baker for that uh, quick introduction. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I think before I start, I would like to ask that we have a moment's silence to remember the lives that were lost during the 2022 national general elections um, in PNG. Uh, so the media reported just over 50. We don't know the numbers of unreported deaths um, in the country. Um, uh, so just a bit about Transparency International and PNG. We are one of over 100 chapters in the world. Uh, there are five in the Pacific. We have uh, TI uh, Vanuatu, TI Solomon Islands, New Zealand and Australia, and a chapter in formation in Fiji. Uh, we share one global vision, and that is a world uh, free of corruption. Uh, for Papua New Guinea itself, we were founded 25 years ago uh, by the late Sir Anthony Seaguru and the likes of uh, Dame Meg Taylor. Uh, for us in Papua New Guinea, um, our mission really is focused on empowering people in PNG to take action against corruption. Our work cuts across all sectors, so we work with government, we work with business, civil society, uh, and youth organizations, uh, community organizations to look at uh, what we need to do together uh, in partnership to address this issue of corruption uh, in PNG. Obviously for us um, as a democracy, elections are a key period where citizens, uh, as you know, uh, come together to uh, really look at uh, what we can do to take action um, against corruption, especially during elections, either through voting for candidates and parties, with a clear and deliberable agenda for anti-corruption or through opposing electoral corruption. Um, for us, we use, for us as an organization, uh, we try to make sure that we get out and do a lot of voter education and civic awareness, and I'll speak to some of the issues that came up uh, during the 2022 national general elections uh, because of this lack of voter education and civic um, awareness. Uh, but in Generally, we use elections to choose our leaders um, who are supposed to represent our views, our opinions uh, in Parliament. Uh, obviously, these leaders make decisions that affect uh, all of us. And so for us as an organization, uh, we encourage people to ensure that, um, yes, being aware of the process is important, uh, but following the process is really the true spirit of uh, democracy, and that is of greater importance. 
There are just some key basic facts for elections in PNG. Uh, we use a limited preferential voting system, uh, so our ballot paper allows us to uh, choose three preferences. Uh, the total number of electorates for this particular election, uh, we had seven new electorates introduced, so a total of 96 open electorates and 22 regional seats, uh, in total 118 seats. Uh, the election management body is the PNG Electoral Commission. Uh, there is a five-year cycle uh, that we go through, and of course the relevant laws are the Constitution, uh, the organic law on national and local level government uh, elections, and of course the organic law on the integrity of political parties and candidates. Unfortunately, um, and I'm not sure if David and you have data on it, uh, the total number of people that were on the roll, the number of people who voted, uh, during this election uh, has not come through as yet from the Electoral Commission. So this is still data that we are trying to gather uh, when we look at the 2020 international general elections that just took place. Uh, for PNG, the elections were held from the 12th of May to the 29th of July, and we had uh, the return of writs extended twice in this period, so from 29th July to 5th August and then the hard constitutional deadline of uh, the 12th of August. So, issues in 2022. Um, no different from 2017 and 2012, uh, the inaccuracy of the electoral roll uh, was widespread, found throughout, uh, right across uh, PNG. It went from people who were uh, not able to find their names on the roll, who were previously on the roll in 2017, um, to people uh, using other people's names to vote. Um, and then in other cases uh, where I observed, uh, particularly in the nation's capital, we had a printed role uh, that you could go up to at the polling station, and if you couldn't find your name on that role, you could go to another table at the polling site and look up the voter role lookup online. And if your name was on the roll, you could get your name written on a piece of paper and go back and get issued a ballot paper. Um, we had a lack of enforcement uh, of election offenses and generally non-compliance with the constitutional requirements. Um, so in 2017, uh, the reports from our observers showed that there were far too many instances um, where the polling place management and electoral administration was not carried out uh, according to the electoral rule. This trend unfortunately continued into 2022. Uh, the print media wi uh, reported widespread electoral irregularities from partiality of the officials, the temporary election workers, uh, to the constitutional, um, constitutionality of the successive deferral of rates. So yes, we experienced the deferral of rates in 2017, during the 2017 elections, but what we found in 2022 was, um, uh, I guess, a lot more push to try and see how far we could test the limits of the Constitution. And as a um, democracy, that was something that was very concerning um, for Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, elections, as we know, are important in our democracy. Eligible citizens get to exercise their uh, right to choose leaders. Um, I myself, because I'm based in NCD, had the ability to go and uh, vote. Uh, but the uh, polling in the nation's capital was deferred, I think, two or three times. So we had a lot of press conferences, a lot of issues, and a lot of confusion about um, whether it was legal uh, to be moving uh, the polling dates as such. Uh, there were a lot of disturbances in the conduct of ballot counting and confusion around the declaration of seats uh, also during this time. Um, so issues around the counting venues um, included how counting would be carried out for particular provinces. So in PNG there's um, 22 uh, provinces, uh, including the autonomous uh, region of Bougainville, um, and each province, each province was able to actually decide how they wanted to carry out counting. So a lot of decision making about the conduct of counting and how declarations would be made uh, was left to a lot of the temporary election workers, and this caused a lot of issues uh, when it came to. Um, the counting period and of course the successive declarations that took place. 
Um, the biggest issue around the around counting and declaration was around accurate progressive results. So the Electoral Commission itself had tried to have an online uh, uh, tally that would show uh, up-to-date results. Unfortunately, I don't recall a time where it was ever updated in real time. Um, and in fact, towards the end of the election period with the uh, extension of the return of writs, uh, the person responsible for updating the uh, tally uh, seemed to have stopped um, doing so. Um, on the 2nd of September, we put out a press statement uh, because of these issues around declarations that uh, had been made under what they termed special circumstances. Um, and so a direct quote from a press statement we put out at the time. On the 9th of August, during the extended counting period, the Commissioner announced in a statement that despite the destruction of ballot papers, the seats of Kabum and Makam in Robert Province would be declared so as to deter those who might seek to disrupt the election. However, this rationale is not supported by a logic, as the counter argument is that it will embolden the assault on PNG's democratic norms. As further candidates who are leading will use disruptive tactics to have themselves declared. A very dangerous and worrying precedent has been set, and one which all thinking Papua New Guineans must not let pass without challenge. It is the view of TIPNG that there should be an investigation of the matter by the Ombudsman Commission to ensure citizens' constitutional rights were not inadvertently or inintentionally, inintentionally violated. Obviously, uh, as we know and we've probably seen in the news, widespread election-related violence continued. Um, another trend that continues um, as the years go by for, T uh, for PNG. The distracted manner in which requisite electoral uh, processes, such as the creation of new electorates uh, three, three months out from an election, the enrollment of new voters, updating of the role, objections to the role, appointment of returning officers, the commencement of the nomination period itself, and the gazette of election and polling schedules cause tension among our communities. Election-related violence previously common in the highlands of Papua New Guinea occurred in coastal areas from deaths, fights, significant damage to state and private property, closure of roads and airports, and the burning of ballot boxes. Um, and I think for the first time in NCD, we had an issue during counting where um, they hadn't allowed mobile phones, or they were not allowing mobile phones uh, to be taken into the counting center. And so we were relying on information that was coming from scrutineers. And there was an altercation between uh, two candidate um, scrutineers uh, which resulted in uh, us basically seeing people running uh, on the road uh, with bush knives attacking each other, which is something that we you know, didn't really see in previous elections for Port Mosby, um, and unfortunately something that happened. So a lot of schools were affected. Um, schools were closed down um, for, for an extended period, so exams had to be moved, national exams had to be moved. Uh, basically, our whole lives were disrupted uh, during the national elections. Um, so that, I guess in the panel that we have, we'll be discussing a lot of the issues that came up um, and the challenges that poses to um, democracy. Uh, but what I thought I would end with is really looking at some of the key recommendations that uh, we are putting forward in our initial summary report. So our full report will come out um, in November uh, this year. Um, in considering areas of action to restore public confidence in the electoral management body, we grouped our recommendations into two broad categories. Um, so transparency recommendations, transparency pertaining to the dissemination of information in a timely, accessible, and accurate manner. Um, the first uh, recommendation we are putting forward is for the PNG Electoral Commission to develop a five-year communication plan to empower voters and partners through proactive sharing of timely, accurate, accessible uh, electoral information. Number two is really looking at the formalizing of the provincial elections during committee functions, um, ensuring that there's uh, 
public sharing of the terms of reference of this provincial election steering committee uh, and ensuring that there is civil society participation uh, in the provincial election steering committees. Number three is to ensure that we're committing funding through the national budget of the entire five-year um, election cycle. Um, so unfortunately, as a country, once we have elections, uh, this, it's not prioritized until a few months before the election. Um, and this uh, caused a lot of issues for us in the 2022 elections. So calling for consistent budget support um, throughout this five-year period. Uh, the fourth is really to table a full report on the conduct of the 2022 national general elections in parliament and making sure that this report is made publicly available. Uh, we had an experience in 2017 when the electoral reforms were proposed, big consultations right across the country, and unfortunately no report tabled in parliament until uh, two months before uh, the 2022 national general elections. Um, so really pushing for an immediate report um, to be presented to Parliament uh, so that action can be taken in the next five years. And of course looking at the integrity recommendations, so integrity actions are focused on ensuring that the norms, processes, the standards, regulations and laws are agreed to and complied with by all responsible parties. Uh, so we offer uh, the first one being developing a public complaints process and an internal anti-corruption strategy which uh, within the PNG Electoral Commission prior to uh, the 2027 national general elections. Um, the practice right now is that all issues uh, or concerns you have in the elections you raise uh, with the court of disputed returns. This seems to be the only avenue available uh, to Papua New Guineans, um, to candidates. Um, so really looking at how we can manage this uh, process and ensure Papua New Guineans can uh, report instances of um, uh, corruption or malfeasance um, during the elections. Um, the next one is really to investigate, arrest and prosecute election officials that are alleged to have engaged in corruption during the 2022 national general elections. Um, our records show that only one electoral official uh, was charged um, and sentenced to uh, time in prison uh, from the 2017 elections. Um, so he was found with about 180,000 in cash in his car in 2017. It took five years for that decision to be handed down, uh, and that was done early this year. We need to see a lot more in terms of prosecutions uh, so that it can act as a deterrent um, to, you know, for this. Um, the second last recommendation is really looking at the electoral management body itself and reviewing its organizational structure, its procedures for engagement with temporary election workers, um, and how we can ensure to pro that we promote accountability um, in the organization as well. And the last point is really looking at establishing and equipping the Electoral Advisory Committee, i.e. prior to the commencement of elections, so that the process for uh, declaring a failed election in an electorate is also clear uh, for uh, the election process um, and for uh, all those involved as well. There are a lot of good things that we can do to improve elections in Papua New Guinea, including uh, improving women representation in Parliament. But these good things are not sustainable without meaningful reforms that help to support transparency and integrity. A formal learning process amongst PNG, EC and key stakeholders must take place with government commitment to implement the reforms. So the Interdepartmental Elections Committee that's chaired by Secretary um, Ivan Pomelo have commissioned the National Research Institute to conduct this and the Prime Minister has committed to setting up a parliamentary committee to review the conduct of the 2022 National General Elections. All of this has to be done this year if we are to really um, meaningfully um, take action um, to improve uh, the elections. For PNG to ensure we improve for the 2027 elections and strengthen the integrity of the election, uh, process, it will require political will and coordinated collaboration across uh, key civil society partners and amongst key agencies. Uh, and the key thing we're finding for us in Papua New Guinea is that uh, we have to do this work uh, ourselves at home and we need to have very honest and frank discussions about what went wrong and 
who need who who's responsible, who needs to be held accountable uh, for what went wrong, uh, and then look at what steps we need to take to improve uh, for the next election. Keeping in mind that our local level government elections are due um, next year as well. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Dr. Baker. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Um, I went to Bougainville in June and was there for five or six weeks helping to coordinate the um, ANU DPA organised domestic uh, observation in Papua New Guinea, which was carried out across 40 constituencies, and we worked in two in Bougainville. Now, it's the first time I've ever had a consistent, up-close um, sight on the election. And I was struck at how impressive the system is. It worked really well in Bougainville. There were problems, a number of serious uh, hitches. They were dealt with in a very peaceful, orderly and respectful manner. And it strikes me that looking at what's happened in parts of the Highlands, NCD, parts of Morabi, even a little in West New Britain and New Ireland, is about, to a large extent, stepping outside the system. The system, as it's designed, works remarkably well when the system is respected and when the integrity of the independent body administering it is respected and their directions uh, acted upon. What's happening in the places where the electoral system is going bad this is not only, I'm painting the very big picture. The real difficulty is that people are stepping outside the system in the way the roles are met, uh, developed, in the way nominations happen, in the way voting happens, in the way counting happens, in the way declarations of results are happening. Candidates and their supporters are stepping outside of the system, manipulating the system, ignoring the rules, and perverting the system. When we see ballot boxes being destroyed, that's part of what I'm talking about. All the internal checks and balances within the system, which are quite remarkable when you see them operating at the election level properly, simply don't work. Because people have got incentives to step outside the system and control it and get elected not on a democratic basis, but on the basis of their control of the system. Now, why is that? It's, why are there incentives for stepping outside of the system? To a large extent, in my view, it goes back to the reform of the provincial government system in Papua New Guinea in 1995, when the constitutional laws were amended to abolish elected provincial governments, which acted as a check on the national government and on MPs at the local level. And in the process of that reform of 95 and subsequent reforms leading up to the establishing in 2014 of district development authorities, MPs were put in charge of government at the sub-national level. We focus a lot on the DSIP and the PSIP, the 10 million kina slush funds that every MP has. And we say that's given MPs a huge amount of money to influence voting and uh, patterns of development, uh, and it, it encourages corruption. But in my view, that's only a very small part of what the MPs control. The provincial MPs are the governors of a largely appointed provincial government, the membership of which they heavily influence. Those provincial governments have public service structures, statutory bodies, annual budgets, planning arrangements, infrastructure programs, contracts. Who's in charge of it all ultimately? The, uh, the provincial MP. The District Development Authorities, established in 2014, were the final step of a tremendous effort made from 1995 by the open MPs 
who were extremely, excuse me, pissed off and jealous because they didn't have the same power over operations in what were now their districts. Previously districts were administrative units that were determined by provincial governments. In, 2000, in 1995, the districts became the borders, sorry, the open electorate borders became the borders of districts. With the DDAs, the MPs, the open MPs were put in charge of a district development authority appointed, heavily influenced by the MP. In addition to their DSIP, they got the budget, the statutory bodies, the contracts, etc. So why are MPs now prepared to spend, or aspiring MPs now prepared to spend so much more than the 10 million of the value of the DSIP and the PSIP? Because if you get into power, you have access to hundreds of millions in value and incalculable benefits in terms of patronage, public service jobs, advisory jobs, and so on. Now, what does this do in terms of behaviour in elections? It means that there is incredible incentive, incentives to become an MP, and it's worth putting money into it and perverting the system at whichever stage you feel best equipped as a candidate to pervert the system by stopping other people from nominating, which is done in all sorts of crude ways, by manipulating the roles, both in their development and in their practical use, controlling polling booths, uh, controlling returning officers, there's actual struggles over who gets into the returning officer's position in many electorates. Controlling the counting process as much as possible, destroying ballot boxes from the areas where you doubt that you'll get your support, and so on. Now we can, and this is all helped by lack of economic development at the local level, in rural areas especially, and great economic inequality, so that there are hordes of young people in particular willing to be paid by aspiring members to do their deeds, violence, destruction of ballot papers, etc. Because this is their one chance to share in the bounty of the state. Now what does this mean for reform of the electoral system? There is absolutely nothing wrong with reforming those bits of the electoral system that uh, don't work well. But it's going to be, I think, impossible to stop this stepping outside of the system at the various points, because there's going to be so much at stake. Coming back to Bougainville, because I've got to finish fairly quickly, Bougainville, they don't step outside the system. I would say part of the reason, there's a whole plethora of reasons, but part of the reasons is that the 95 reforms don't apply in Bougainville. The provincial member is not the governor. The open members do not head DDAs, etc. So that, one, that massive set of incentives to step outside of the system don't apply in Bougainville. So my, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, prediction is that reform of the electoral system, well-intentioned though it might be, and well it might clean up some things about the worst aspects of the operation of the system, it's not going to change things because you're not going to get reforms to the basics. You're not going to get reforms to the provincial government system or to the electoral system where it hurts the MPs because it's against their interests to reform those things. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that, Tanush. Um, so, there were plenty of media reports during the national election um, about the state of PNG's electoral roll. You know, it was widely perceived to be inaccurate. Many citizens not being able to cast their votes, as um, Ariana talked about. And much could be said about the common role, like why roll updates weren't done, um, its politicised nature, and what can be done to fix the situation. But I don't want to focus on any of these complex topics in my 10 minutes. I simply want to share the ways that these flawed 
electoral rolls were administered at polling stations in some locations that are observed. Because for all the talk of a poorly administered election, it was the polling officials who were put in really difficult situations. They knowingly received these flawed roles from the Electoral Commission and had to face the communities. How they chose to navigate these polling day arrangements had significant implications for where the citizens were able to vote. And as the title infers, there's no good outcomes when starting with a flawed electoral roll. So I'm going to walk you through four cases of what polling officials did with the common roll using mainly video clips and photos to give you a real feel for what transpired at the election. And I'll spend most of my time on the first case, which was to follow the process of using the roll to identify voters as instructed by the Electoral Commission. The second was to use the roll as a tally sheet by just crossing names off regardless of who the voters were in line. The third was to call out names on the roll so citizens present could step forward and vote. And finally, there was the case of just simply ignoring the roll, whereby local leaders decided how to split their allocation of ballot papers. And I need to be clear that the perspective I'm offering here is from Morabay, Medang and Eastern Highland provinces that I observed. So this first case of following the process comes from a polling station in Lai. Polling officials here were strict about finding citizens' names on the common roll um, before they could vote, as you can see on screen. And I've cut this video down to the last minute of what was a four-minute interaction. But take, and I often um, position myself behind polling officials identifying voter names to understand its accuracy. And the main takeaways were that it was very rare that names were able to be found in less than a few minutes. In many cases, citizens would simply point to a name on the roll and say it was them. And polling officials would agree to cross out their name and let them vote like is the case that's happening on screen. As verifying voter identities was next to impossible because the large majority of PNG citizens don't have photo IDs. And the main issue was that thoroughly checking a flawed roll took a lot of time. So what were the consequences of uh, what was happening here in late? So this polling station was allocated 800 ballot papers for single day polling, but only 241 votes were cast or just over 30% at the close of polls. The remaining 70% were still in their ballot books as I've circled here um, on screen, which was in clear view of citizens and scrutineers. And there was a long line of citizens still wanting to vote. So here's what happened when the last vote was cast. So after the presiding officer claimed they had a crisis, as you heard, um, there was plenty of shouting from ups upset citizens. Then the police steps in and you can read the broad translation on screen. Okay, and then after that, the Defence Force personnel say that the unused ballot papers would be burnt. Okay. 
And so this is how they burnt the ballot papers. So the first one is obviously the beginning of the process, and then the later one is when the fire gets uh, well and truly um, happening. I'll play them both at the same time. So you can see that um, following the process of strictly using the roll, resulting in two thirds of allocated ballot papers burnt, disenfranchised voters. So hardly a free and fair process. Okay, so the second case I want to talk about was the most common practice at polling stations in Leigh was simply to use the roll as a tally sheet by crossing names off the roll in alphabetical order regardless of who came to vote. And this was happening at polling stations which were just hundreds of metres away from the first case I showed you. And you can see in this clip that the polling official is counting 10 women in the female line. And the result is simply ticking 10 names off the female electoral roll, which is on the right, starting at A in the alphabet, going through to B, C, until all the votes were exhausted. So comparatively speaking, this polling process was much faster. As this polling station... I didn't think that would be so funny. But this polling station used up its 1,200 ballot papers in less than six hours after voting, which was incredibly quicker than the previous example I showed you of using the roll. And it also resulted in um, long queues, as you can see here. And it seemed clear that word was spreading um, throughout Lay that at this polling station, you could simply just go up to the polling station and vote no matter who you were. So these are just two snippets of that video. Okay. So moving on to case three, which is calling out names on the roll, is in a rural location in the Medane Open Electorate. Polling officials here decided to decided to call out names on the roll using the megaphone that you can see um, on screen. And citizens who were present and were called got their chance to vote. And local leaders were at the polling station to ensure those called were actually people who reside in this location. So some form of verification. The problem here was that all, once all the names were called on the roll, which happened in the morning and again in the afternoon, most people had still not voted, simply because their names weren't on the roll. <coughs> And then polling officials and community leaders engaged in a heated discussion. And here's a clip of a community leader advocating that long-term residents should be given the opportunity to vote first, even if their names weren't on the roll. So at this place, older citizens did get a chance to vote at the end of polling, even though their names weren't on the roll, but others just had to take their chance with voting the following day, as this was a roving um, ballot box that moved to a nearby location. Okay, and so the final process um, I want to show you comes from the Abura Wananara electorate in the Eastern Highlands, where polling officials did not even bother to open the roll. And this clip is from the district station Nayura, where electoral officials and security personnel were still organising transporting ballot papers and materials for single day polling at 11am when this video was taken, when polling was meant to start at 8. Um, due to many logistical delays, actual polling um, started to take place around 4pm, it was meant to close at 6, and this is what I observed. So, as this first clip shows, all ballot papers at this station were removed from their books, signed, and then divided into piles. So the open seat is pink and the regional seat is blue. Second, citizens in this village were able to mark their ballot paper for the regional seat here in full view of polling officials and other citizens. Not only was the roll book never open, but there were no efforts at all to even set up this polling station. Okay, 
Third, local leaders in this community agreed to split ballot papers for the open seat among three prominent candidates. And in this clip, you can see the candidate scrutineers are the one who are filling out um, the ballot papers for the communities. And you can see the polling officials here actually facilitating that process. And finally, once the scrutineers filled out these ballot papers, there was kind of a folding ceremony uh, whereby all marked ballot papers were all nicely folded and put into the box for the open seat. Now, while many things could be said about this polling process, um, this was by far the most calm and peaceful process that I have ever <laughs> talked about. <laughs> Which is to say nothing, of course, for what could have happened here either before election day or after election day. And so, finally, to conclude, um, it's next to impossible to deliver a free and fair elections when polling officials have to use a flawed role. Um, the four cases I just showed so showed massive contrasts in the way the role was used and ultimately who got to vote on polling day. And finally, I'd like to thank um, Theresa Mickey for help with uh, these videos. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'll launch straight into it. Um, our paper is on the diversity of Papua New Guinean electoral regimes. Um, <coughs> a difficulty with analysing Papua New Guinea elections is that like much else about the country, there's a lot of diversity, which can be especially perplexing because sometimes this diversity seems to matter and sometimes it does not. A national general election is really a misnomer. They're there are really dozens of distinct ways the elections are run in practice, different regional and local electoral regimes. In many places, what transpires in a national general election is an election in name only. In the extreme cases, there's effectively no polling, but rather a paramilitary struggle for control of ballot boxes. Elections in these areas are effectively turf wars between criminal politicians, in which the electoral administration is either coerced, sidelined, or co-opted. In other areas, the elections is much more easily recognized as an election, with relatively minor problems. The difference can be jarring, and a person accustomed to the more benign forms of political contest in PNG may have a difficult time understanding the different regimes elsewhere. To them, and I include myself in there, I started studying Bougainville uh, and then moved on to the Highlands. Um, it may appear that chaos reigns in those parts, but unfortunately that is not the case. Uh, the collapse of electoral rules in PNG is not driven by pure chaos. It is deliberately engineered for political purposes. So how do we make sense of Papua New Guinea's electoral diversity? Um, here I want to suggest that we can classify them into four types, partly because as an anthropologist, wherever I see a political scientist do one of these things, I get really angry, and then I try to find out why it's wrong. So hopefully you can find out why it's wrong. Um, so in type one electoral regimes, which could, you know, I found in some lowland areas, maybe in Bougainville, um, this actually involves voting by individual citizens. Elections are messy, but are easily recognized as elections with queues of voters and regular procedures. This is the form of voting that is usually visible in the media within PNG and internationally, as the areas in which it is present are the safest and most easily accessible to journalists. In these areas, electoral procedure is followed or is attempted for voter identification. Citizens are checked for enrollment against the common role, a slow and, as you saw, a cumbersome process. Would be voters who are not found in the role are not allowed to vote. Inevitably, frustration with the quality of the role is the most conspicuous problem in this regime. Setting this aside, however, issues are relatively minor. Emphasis on relatively. Electoral crimes involving the mishandling of ballots, such as multiple voting, pre-filled ballots, and ballot stuffing, are generally rare or entirely absent. Now, importantly, these relative, the, the relatively benign processes that we see in these type one electoral regimes do not translate into obvious political differences 
in terms of the type of politician elected. Politics is here, as it is elsewhere in the country, distributive. Its aim is to place candidates in government so as to direct resources back to local communities. The methods differ. Now, if we turn to this type two uh, electoral system, the second type, uh, which we could see uh, happening in Eastern Highlands, Kimbu, to some extent Sipik and Morobe that we, uh, we just saw some videos of. Uh, here, um, really, this, this system aims to involve people practically in, vo in voting, or at least individual voters physically handle the ballot paper, which sounds like nothing, but it's pretty important. Uh, however, there is far greater direct interference with the electoral process by political agents. Voters may be allowed to fill second or third preferences only, with the remaining options previously completed by agents. Secrecy is minimal and often deliberately subverted, both by agents attempting to enforce diktats on voters and by voters seeking to demonstrate their allegiance to candidates. In these systems, discipline at a clan or village level is at least in part achieved uh, in pri by pri private and public coercion including possibly serious violence, reprisals, destruction of property. The most conspicuous difference to an observer is that there is no voter identification in these areas. The common role is not used or used only as a tally. Consequently, voting is very rapid. Multiple voting is frequent and turnout tends to be, clo to, to be close to the total number of available ballots or even exceeds it sometimes. In these type two uh, systems, the core logic of electoral democracy has been corrupted. Rather than one person, one vote according to conscience, there is a collective effort to exhaust all available ballots according to a usually clan level decision. However, the process still necessitates cooperation among many, even most people in a polling station or village. These forms of electoral rigging more or less reflect a volontaire general at the local level. In some respects, this is an overt version of what happened, what trans sometimes transpires quietly in the type one regimes. Whilst it is critical to note that in general, nobody is free to dissent from these practices where they take place, and voting is therefore unfree for individuals, this type of electioneering is often regarded as normative it is what is expected of an election, and in some respects, it is indeed valued. Uh, the, in, in the ideal case, what is achieved is a powerful statement of clan political unity, which for some participants might be a more prized value than the abstractions of liberal democracy. Violence in these areas tends to peak during or after counting votes, at which point candidate agents come to realize who has and who has not stuck by their promises. Okay, moving on to down the path to ruin, we come to type three, which are electoral systems, which are a qualitatively more radical approach. Whereas in type two regimes, the election consists of a competition between clan networks to mobilize voters at polling time and opportunistically to seize control of the polling processes. In type three, competition also seeks to deprive competitors of the capacity to poll. This is a decisive change, which opens the door for a far more hostile form of political organization. While in type two systems, the, the election consists of a political struggle between clans with considerable friction and possibly violence. In type three systems, violence becomes an instrument of electioneering at end polling time. The polling struggle acquires paramilitary contours. We hear stories of bridges being blown up to prevent ballot boxes from traveling around. Not an electoral strategy. Uh, in many polling stations, this becomes an election without voters, as it becomes simply too dangerous to vote, and the handling of, okay, yeah, and the handling of ballot papers is at any rate monopolized by candidate agents. The type of electoral crimes again, again change here with ballot stuffing, false ballot boxes and destruction of rival efforts eclipsing, mul uh, eclipsing multiple voting and the sale and of votes and, and so on. And finally, we come to uh, type four areas in which we have a kind of paradoxical peace taking hold. 
But what has happened in these areas, which are sort of a, a development of the type three areas, is that there has been a cartelization of politics and, when, and politicians have been able to form deals, make deals prior to the election in order to prevent outright fighting. So you have less violence, but you have a great, uh, much more intensified level of control by criminal, um, essentially, you know, violent gangs. Now, I'm going to truncate this here and say it's a brief and schematic picture of Papua New Guinea's uh, uh, electoral diversity. We have really, you know, we can classify the system in terms of the different forms of violence and who's responsible for them. What it boils down to is, Thing. It's really that you have areas in the coast where there's a high attempted compliance with the electoral rules, um, and the process is uh, the electoral process is has a degree of normativity to where people come to the polling station and see uh, experience what they expect uh, uh, to happen. And violence is relatively rare. Then we have areas in which compliance with electoral rules is much uh, much lower. Um, and, but you still have a high degree of normativity. The communities are involved and they come and they see the election happening and is what they expected it to be. And you have sporadic violence there. And finally, we, then we come to the level three ones where compliance is gone and so is normativity. In these areas, in the so-called upper highlands where there's fighting and murder happening around election time, this isn't happening out of a, a great degree of, uh, it's not because communities want this to happen. There is unfortunately a discourse that blames the sort of destruction of electoral systems in, upper, in, in the highlands of PNG, as if this was something that people in the highlands wanted, when really what is happening is that their democratic rights are being destroyed and they are being killed in order for this to happen. It's a quite serious situation. Anyway, so this is a, a very diverse picture. What is interesting is how little it seems to matter when it comes to parliament. Because all these people get elected in elections which are so different from each other as a mafia shootout might be from some sort of sleepy council election. And then they all go to parliament and 99 or whatever it was, they all decide to vote for the, the one prime minister as if they had no real differences. Where is the constituency for democracy in PNG's parliament? basically the question that this puts. Okay. I'll jump in and this is probably a little bit asked about in the sense that um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, and which is sort of quite funny because I'm coming last but anyway. Um, so um, uh, as you've probably already gathered um, Department of Pacific Affairs with support from the um, Australian Air Program undertook systematic observations of the most recent um, national general elections in PNG. Um, it was the sixth consecutive election that I've observed and the fourth consecutive election um, where we've undertaken um, a large scale observation uh, of the election. Um, the observation was the most comprehensive one we've undertaken to date. It involved 350 PNG-based citizen observers and about a dozen ANU um, personnel who went for different periods um, of their, in, in different lengths of time. Um, specifically, we fielded 44 small observer teams, each of which was led by um, a PNG academic or researcher, and we completed over 9,000 person days of observation um, between June and August of this year. Collectively, the team made detailed observations in 54 of the 118 electorates um, and surveyed over 10,000 citizens. Um, as you might appreciate, we're yet to analyse all of that data, so we're not really in a position to make sort of particularly definitive uh, statements about um, at the election. Um, and for this reason, we sort of took this approach today that each of us would sort of reflect on, um, you know, different aspects of what we saw. And you've probably already gathered, you know, we went to different parts of the country. Um, and so, because there was a small number of ANU personnel, we sort of divided up the country, in a sense, and, um, 
and 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 I went to the to the Highlands, and and as Anthony said, he went to Bougainville, and 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 you know Colin went to Morro Bay and different things. So and Karen was observing in 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 Central and NCD. So we've all got um, you know quite different experiences of the election as well. Um, uh, anyway, but notwithstanding the variable nature of elections in PNG, um, which both Tiago and Colin have highlighted, I think we can say with a fair degree of confidence that the 2022 elections witnessed further deterioration in the overarching electoral environment. And to quote our TIPNG colleagues from their recent um, preliminary assessment, um, the accumulated failures on the part of the PNG Electoral Commission in the preparation, conduct and delivery and conclusion of the 2022 national general elections have resulted in a severely flawed electoral process. And this has seen electoral confidence plunge to an all-time low. And certainly in the Highlands that was really evident. Um, I think what was also evident was that there were efforts on the part of you know, communities to try and um, restore that confidence in some in some ways. You know, but that in efforts to restore confidence also resulted in, um, I suppose, to to use Anthony's language, a stepping outside of the system. So people developing, um, you know, their own procedures that uh, were certainly at odds with um, formal procedures, but as an effort to to um, you know, to, to restore some confidence in it. So the sorts of things we saw were, um, you know, prior to the elections, um, you know, uh, candidates signing the inside of the ballot boxes so that when the boxes came back, they could check whether they were the, the, the correct boxes. Um, obviously, you have open and regional boxes in each place and then in provinces you have multiple electorates. So in some places they, they were using spray paint to spray the outside of boxes as well to, to distinguish which electorate they were supposed to be in, in, in a particular sort of province and things like that. So these local efforts to, to try and uh, have some confidence that the boxes that went out were the boxes that, that came back again. Um, and the, the reality is that um, you know people have good reason not to have confidence in that. So in, um, for instance, in uh, in Southern Highlands, where polling was was delayed for a few days, um, the, they were meant to poll on the Monday. The boxes were sent out to each of the districts on the Friday, and then on the Saturday, the PNGDF got some intel um, that led them to go and collect the ballot boxes again and bring them back into Mendy to, to check the boxes. And when they came back, there were, um, and the boxes had been overnight in a, locked up in respective district police stations. When the boxes were brought back in, um, there were several boxes already stuffed full of ballot papers. Um, and this was two days before polling was due to commence. Um, so they then had to, you know, sort of go through everything again, redistribute all the ballot papers again, and, and that took a couple of days and, and the elections were delayed. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, so over the last couple of months when I've been in PNG observing the elections, one of the things that people have asked me over and over again was, how do I think that the 2022 elections compared with previous elections? And many of the people who've asked me that question have simultaneously reflected that the election seemed quieter, particularly in the Highlands region, possibly less violent, and, um, and thus better, perhaps. Um, uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I plan to talk a little bit about some of what I saw in the Highlands, show you some pictures, um, and probably reflect particularly on the, the central and upper highlands um, and, and sort of to think about how the election was, was different. And I think a lot of what we saw in the upper and western highlands probably relates to what Tiago was talking about with his type four sort of um, classification where um, the, the, the level of control is so um, strong that it, it um, that it removes a whole lot of contestation, um, and so it sort of seems quieter in a sense. But um, 
but the, the process is sort of so much more rotten and so so few people are actually getting to, to cast their votes in any sort of meaningful way and, and in fact not um, doing that. Um, so just a little bit more by way of background. So obviously PNG elections are fiercely contested. There's large numbers of candidates. Um, the number of candidates who contested 2022 increased on um, 2017, so continued that, that trend of um, candidate proliferation. Even with the addition of seven new seats, um, we saw the, the average number of candidates rise in this election. Um, but in some places, there was as many as sort of 70 plus candidates in particular, uh, contesting particular electorates. So if we, and, and again, um, other people have pointed to this, um, there's a complete lack of results and, and things this time around. Um, but if we think about the results from, uh, look at the results from 2017, we know that 70% of candidates receive less than 3% overall vote share. So the majority of candidates are um, performing, you know, not getting very many votes at all. Um, there's high voter turnout. Um, in, in many places, but again, when we get to that sort of type four that Tiago's talking about, um, there's a, you know, people aren't participating in the, in the process and they're locked out of the process or they're choosing not to um, for security reasons. Um, despite the fact that there is this, um, you know, sort of, that elections are hyper competitive, so to speak, um, Many, many voters are being denied genuine choice through things like block voting, coerced collective voting, violence, intimidation, and pre-marked ballot papers. Um, and I think, for me, one of the ways that the 2022 elections differed from previous ones was the extent to which voting was controlled. And so I think, you know, if we're talking the, up, the Central and Upper Highlands, I mean, talking Jiwaka, Western Highlands, Southern Highlands, Hella and Enga, um, you know, we're very much seeing a situation where, where voting is controlled and very, very few people are um, participating in the process in any sort of way. So ballot papers being filled out by a very small number of um, people. Um, so now I've just got some pictures really just to reflect on some of this. So one of the things that I saw this time, which I have not seen like and I said, I've observed the last six elections, um, was in the past, I have seen candidates in the vicinity of polling stations, right? They might be on the road, they might be on their vehicle outside of the polling station, not inside the polling station. But in this election, what we saw and over and over again was candidates um, and people talking about, you know, where your umbilical cord is buried, like that's your place, right? So you can claim all those ballot papers at that place. And so we've got candidates that are actually in the polling station. So here we've got a candidate here with his name and everything and his box number on the back of his shirt. So he's inside the polling station, he's standing over the polling officials and he's instructing them how the ballot papers are to be filled out. You can see him in a couple of those pictures. What's really interesting, oh, and I've sort of clipped it a bit here. He also, and we start to talk about the, you know, some of that paramilitary stuff. And so sometimes that is the sort of militias that candidates themselves are arming and giving uniforms and things to. And we saw lots of that in Hella um, leading up to the election. And then post the election, we've actually seen um, cases where people were using those particular, particular um, groups that we know um, uh, um, are using those, those uniforms that were brought in to um, hold up people on the road, they're raping women, they're doing all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, the road's quite problematic at the moment. Um, in this particular case, um, this candidate didn't have his own militia, but he had managed to secure the support of the Long Range Reconnaissance Unit. So he had an LLRU, PNGDF with him, um, so the bearded guys, um, and and they were there, sort of, um, you know, sort of um, creating a situation that allowed this to happen. And sorry, it's not particularly visible in the picture, but you can see the fence over there, and the voters and the citizens are all on the fence, and they they are locked outside. 
of the vet. So um, there were people at that polling station wanting to vote, but they weren't able to, to, to get in. Um, this particular candidate is an open candidate um, at this particular place. Um, so one of the regional candidates had, um, you know, sort of quite concertedly over a number of years, actually um, been putting money into the local warlords to control this. So outside of the fence as well, there were um, a couple of well-known wo lo local warlords that were also um, sort of controlling who could come in or out at that particular polling place. Um, here we have another polling station, um, also in Hella, that's controlled by um, a candidate. He's claiming all the ballot papers. Um, the candidate there is the man with the blue bag and he's just handed over this sort of money to, to, to this guy who was a polling official. Um, and then you can see him standing there at the back um, watching as they're filling out all the ballot papers for him. Um, and what we had here was we actually had a mobile squad that was there parked at that polling station. A full, like, um, you know, there was probably about eight, ten guys uh, in uniforms, in helmets, in body armour, uh, armed. And as the polling officials were filling out the ballot papers, they were handing them to the security forces to protect them um, until they were ready to put them into the, into the ballot box. So again, a candidate there handing out money inside the polling station and standing over the polling officials directing them how to fill out the ballot papers. And like I said, never, never seen that before. Um, you know, they might be around, they might be in their cars, but they, I've never seen them in the polling stations controlling the polling stations. Um, I haven't um, put up some photos on the, the next slides, but um, as well as polling stations that were being controlled by candidates, um, we had polling stations in, Tara, in, in, in Hella and in Tari that were being controlled by um, the, the really high profile warlords um, as well who had been bought off uh, or, and were supporting a particular candidate and there was, and I have video footage of this um, where they were at a polling station where the wa local warlord was, was armed and his boys were armed and they were telling the community that they decided how they were going to vote and how all the ballot papers were going to be filled in and surprisingly three, three elderly men actually spoke up and said, well, no, we don't agree with that. That's not who we want to vote for. Um, anyway, and then the warlord said, oh, okay. All right, so now what I want you to do is everybody who's prepared to vote the way that I'm telling you, you can come and line up here. And anybody who wants to disagree with me, you can line up over here. And so he was challenging the community to, um, uh, interestingly, um, there were other people around and there was um, um, a group of women at the side in the video who were actually praying for um, God to come and end the world and to release them from the, um, from the warlord's control. Um, it's, a, it's a community that's um, really, really suffered under this particular warlord. So, um, anyway. Uh, uh, here I have a quote from um, one of our um, observers. This is talking about, this is also in Hella, um, talking about the polling at um, Corriba, Copiago at Corriba Station. Um, at Corriba Station, the people didn't vote, even for second and third preferences. So in the past, what we've seen in elections in Hella for the last couple of elections was often um, first preferences being marked, pre-marked, um, but voters and, and people would say they can cast their democratic rights on two and three. So there would still be, um, you know, some, you know, semblance of people participating in the process. Um, but this was this time they didn't get to do that <coughs> at all. The officials shared the second and third preferences for the open seat and the one, two, and three on the regional paper to candidates of their choosing. All of the first preferences were marked for William Boundo. This kind of voting was the first of its kind. They brought all the ballot boxes for six council wards into Corriba Station and lined them up side by side. The candidate and his supporters told the officials just to sign and fill all the ballot papers. Even the security forces couldn't believe their eyes. They, the security forces, protested, but nobody listened. The voters were outside the fence and they were trying to force me to say something, but I couldn't. Um, 
and um, this particular observer has observed the last four elections as well and was um, really struck by how different um, the nature of polling uh, was this time around. Um, the, um, and really, sort of across Hella, I didn't really see any votes particularly legitimately cast at all. Everything was sort of being particularly controlled in this sort of way. Um, and uh, yeah, so now I'm just going to, um, this is actually uh, some pictures from Juwaka. This is the largest polling station in Juwaka. Um, one of the things that's interesting, and we talked about the differences across the country, and, and um, Ariane made the point around um, provincial steering committees and things, you know, adopting different processes and, and different things. One of the, the areas that's very different from one province to the next is the way that they distribute polling stations. And so in some places, they will have a single polling station per ward, regardless of how many people are enrolled. What that means in a place like Jiwaka is that you can actually have three, four thousand people on a single ward roll. You know, absolutely impossible to process that number of voters in a day. Um, on, on the other hand, um, in um, parts of the New Guinea Islands and, and New Island and things, you can have, you know, sort of only a hundred or so people on the roll at those particular places. So there's much more opportunity for people in some parts of the country to participate in the process than, than in others. This particular polling station was quite interesting. It is a, it's a very large one, so they would have had no chance of um, uh, getting through their ballot papers in a single day. But what you can see here is just, you know, groups of men filling all out the ballot papers and they're putting rubber bands around them. I had a video that accompanied this, which was then the boys trying to stuff them all in the box. Um, and that was quite a process in and of itself. Anyway, I took these photos and I took the video, at which point I was then confronted by um, uh, some of the, the, the community leaders there who came up to me and said, uh, we decided in the morning that nobody was gonna be allowed to take photos or videos here because we don't want anything that might sort of make its way to the Court of Disputed Returns. And, um, and so they, they did want me to hand over my, my, my phone, but we um, talked our way out of there and, and, and left. But anyway, that was uh, that particular polling session. Interestingly, um, there's fighting still going on there, and just right there. Last night, one person was killed. This morning, another person was killed. There was three people killed in the last in, uh, two days ago. So this is a real fighting zone. It's actually being raised um, to the ground at the moment, so, um, and totally election related. Um, okay, here's another way that um, voting was controlled, and this is from, from Western Highlands, and this was quite interesting. This was a, um, one of the, um, a sitting member decided to provide these high visibility vests to, um, well, to, to his own election security. So each polling station, he had 20 of these guys in these high-vis vests, the, the polling stations that were sort of under his control, and they said on the back of them, um, you know, 2022 National General Election Security. So they looked like security. And I went to this polling station, and I was like, I haven't seen these everywhere else. So how come you guys got... Because actually, interestingly, this time around, even the polling officials didn't get uniforms. In the past, they were issued with, with shirts and things, so you could tell who the polling officials were. This time, it was really hard because they didn't have uniforms. And so this was a place where... Anyway, um, what was very interesting about this polling station was that only the people in the hype is best um, were allowed to have biros inside the polling station. So you had to, and, and it was a case of voters were going up, they were being issued with ballot papers, but they then had to go to one of the people in the orange vest and tell them who they wanted to vote for and the, the people in the orange vest would fill it out on their behalf. Um, we also see one of the men in the orange vest here instructing the polling officials how to fill out ballot papers while they're, uh, as well. Um, I did see a very sort of interesting exchange happen at this particular place where um, a woman um, 
went over to the guy in the orange and he filled out her vote and he put it in for her. And then she went back over to the presiding officer and said, um, I need a new ballot paper because mine's been spoiled. And he said, okay, give me the spoiled one. And she's like, I can't because it's in the ballot box. And he said, well, why did you put it in the ballot box? And she said, I didn't put it in there. The guy in the orange vest did. And she said, well, how, how was it? He, he asked her, how was it spoiled? And she said, well, I said I wanted to vote for this person, this person, and this person. Um, but he filled it out for, you know, three different candidates. And so that was the basis on which she said her paper. Anyway, she argued. And eventually they got so exasperated, they gave her a ballot paper and let her fill it out herself. Um, um, <laughs> while we were at this particular polling station, watching all of this, the polling station we'd been at previously. And this is, this is Hagen, Mount Hagen. This is an urban polling station in Mount Hagen. This is Queen's Park, right? And the ones below that, um, down at um, Warrakum, we've been there, we were observing, we were standing in the, you know, with everybody watching, people were lined up in a queue. While we were there, um, a 10-seater drove in, it ploughed straight into the people that were queued up waiting to vote. They jumped, about five guys jumped out and started shooting and um, they hijacked the ballot boxes, sort of right in front of us. And so we left that polling station and went to this polling station and there's another one in between. And, um, and when we were here, we could hear shooting that went on for about 20 minutes at the polling station that was down below, the intermediate polling station. And then they came to this polling station to try and hijack the boxes, but they've got this very heavy metal fence that they've put around Queen's Park now. And so they locked and, and chained the fence so the people couldn't come in to steal the ballot boxes, but the people who were shooting were on the outside of the fence and we were all on the inside. So, um, you know, but anyway, so this is right in, you know, this is urban Mount Hagen and people are um, having gunfights and they're driving cars into polling stations to hijack boxes. So, anyway, um, yeah. So, that's it, I'll finish there. <laughs>